And welcome to Patriots Lament right here on KFAR, where we're going to be talking about liberty and the issues surrounding it. As always, whatever's on your mind is fair game. If you'd like to call in and participate in the program, the number to call is 458-TALK, 458-8255. Joining me in the studio, I'm, by the way, I'm Steve Floyd, the man with the face made for radio. Joining me on my right, although possibly to my left politically, we've got uh, Dave Giesel, the anarcho-capitalist from the Fairbanks chapter of the Campaign for Liberty. Good morning, Dave. Good morning, Steve. And uh, also from Bighorn Enterprises to Dave's right, my left, we've got Josh Bennett from Bighorn Enterprises, one of the sponsors of the show. Good morning, Josh. Good morning, Steve. Well, gentlemen, what's on your mind today? Take it. Uh, <laughs> well, we were we were just having a, uh, a voting discussion in the studio. Did you take a vote about what to uh, No, we didn't. But if we did, it would have been non-binding and, and non-coercive. Um so I was talking to a friend of mine last night, and he raised an interesting question about uh, democracy, which is which is pretty fun. Uh, he was having a discussion with his parents, and he was explaining to them why voting for Ron Paul isn't throwing your vote away, right? And they're like, "Well, in a democracy, you have to vote for the person who's electable." And he's like, "No, let's consider the premise of a representative, you know, form of government like democracy. In order for democracy to work." based on its own premises that you're electing a representative of you you have to actually vote for someone who represents you not vote for someone who's electable who you admit doesn't represent you as soon as you've done that you've given up you've ceded the most fundamental principle of democracy which is that you're actually voting for someone who represents you electable or not right and uh yeah, I just thought that was a, a brilliant insight because I remember growing up my entire life. I mean, I don't vote now. I think the whole thing's stupid. But uh, growing up my entire life, it was like, well, you know, you can't just be an ideologue when it comes to voting. you got to vote for people who are electable. And I never thought of that as, I mean, I once I realized democracy was a joke. Anyway, it didn't matter. But even that premise for the people who participate goes completely against any possibility of that system working. Well, let's look at that that premise, because when, I mean, in order for democracy to work, there has to be the threat of force behind it, because if a group of people get together and take a vote, and even just one person disagrees with what the outcome of that vote is, and yet is forced to go along with the outcome of that vote, what is that? Yeah, uh, of course you have to have, right. And that's the the moral question is totally different. I mean, this is just a functional question. Yeah, the moral question of democracy is, uh, uh, it's like, uh, boy, I think it's what Lenin said about the question of politics. The fundamental question of politics is who does what to whom, right? <laughs> so, yeah, of course, democracy is premised on pointing guns at people who you disagree with, which morally is disgusting and, you know, is childish to say the least. Even if a majority of the people want to point the gun at you, though? <laughs> Which what? is funny anyways, because if you think about it, when you vote for someone, and usually it's someone you didn't like, but even the people that get the person that they like, let's say they get 50% of the vote, and after they get in, doesn't matter who it is, 20% of the people, or 50% of those people disagree with 50% of the stuff he does anyways, yep. and 50% more disagree with the other stuff that he does. So who is actually being represented? One of the one of the guys at our uh, discussion group last night raised the point that, that uh, since most politicians lie, even if you elect somebody who does represent you, right, mm -hmm. falling in line with this premise of democracy, um, <laughs> as soon as they get in office, they no longer represent you. Regardless of whether or not they represent me or whether they represent you or somebody else, I'm having a hard time just processing the fact that I'm going to take a vote and force somebody to do something that does not agree with me. Mm -hmm. uh, that I'm, 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 I didn't used to have a hard time with it. In fact, as you know, I served in the Army, and it was part of my job to go and force people to do things that we wanted them to do. I mean, that's the whole point of why I got sent to Bosnia, is that some bigwigs decided that the war ought to be over, and so they sent troops in to make it over. And so I was there not to do my job. I mean, that is what I was trained to do, to interrogate 
prisoners of war. I was there instead to stop people from killing each other that I had no interest in and that I could not possibly see any constitutional reason, and yet I was there. Anyway, I digress. Point is, I didn't used to have a problem with using force to go and project my will on others through voting or project the will of the United States on other countries. I mean, it's just basically a macrocosm of the same issue. Now I'm beginning to have more and more of a problem with, with it, and it's not because I find myself having my my will being... I, not that I'm having other people's will being forced on me. That's not what I'm having a problem with. What I'm having a problem with is philosophically that issue of well, what, it, what if I won the vote? What if I were the one trying to force my will on others? And, and that's where I'm, I'm finding myself giving pause. It, 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 can you talk me down out of the street, Dave? <laughs> well, that's, yeah, the idea of, of political participation is based on the very strong moral principle that we all heard as children, which is might makes right. <laughs> if, if enough of right? us decide that that's the way it's going to be, well, I'm gone and that's the way it's going to be. Darn it, that's how it's going to be, or yeah. else, yeah. right? Yeah. Nine, so. pe nine people get elected across the <clears throat> river there, go to that building over there, and they are smarter just by the basis of being elected, they automatically become so wise they can tell you what to do. Now, if you're walking down the street and you saw John Davies, Michael Dukes, Natalie Howard, or anything, they said, you know what? You're going to do blah, blah, blah. You're going to live your life, blah, blah, blah. You'd look at him and say, no, I'm not. You can't tell me what to do. What are you talking about? I'm a free person. They go into that building and they do the same thing. And you got nothing to say about it. Except unless we go down the road with uh, their enforcement powers, but but even even then, I was going to say that the look at that, the, the look at how the there are people within the borough right now that are trying to get enforcement powers because right now all they've got is a toothless kitty, and they they want to go in there and put some dentures in and make a ferocious tiger out of it. They can go out and and start putting some people, you know, putting some hurt on people for not complying with their wishes. Right now, if if you don't comply i mean they don't really have anything else to do except to take you to court which ends up costing them uh and could cost them more than what they could get from you in fines in the first place well look at the uh the automobile tax that they talked about this last week now if matt want i hope you're listening came up to you and said i want you to give me 70 bucks for every car that you have a year you'd be like what i'm i'm not going to give you what yes give me 70 dollars Every year, for every vehicle that you register in this borough, you'd say, get out of here. What are you talking about? You're insane. You'd, you'd think he was a nut job, right? But they can go in that building and vote the exact same thing. Now they have power to say, ah, you will pay me $70 per vehicle that you register in this borough. So someone can come up to you, Lisa Murkowski, uh, Obama come up to you and say whatever he wants to say. I am going, I want you to pay for my contraceptives. I want you to do this and that. And you say, no, I'm not going to do that. Why? What gives you the right to rule over me? Then he gets in the office and he can write a little note, an executive order or pass a bill to force you to do the exact same thing that you wouldn't otherwise do on your own. You're not helping me out of the tree, Josh. You, you're, you're, you're driving me further up in the branches here. The only but... way to come down is to shoot you out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's interesting because it, what it boils down to is just a very, ace, like a high degree of asymmetry in opinion. So, like, I have different opinions than you, Josh, and you, Steve, and, you know, different opinions than my neighbors. But I get along with, you know, most of those people quite well. And um, our differences of opinion aren't a source of conflict because we don't point guns at each other about it. And uh, and then as soon as anyone I know, you know, if you guys, one of you guys got elected, suddenly our difference of opinion is not just, okay, well, you know, that's okay. You go do your thing. I'll go do mine. Yeah, you're it's, going down. Guess, guess how it's going to be, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> guess how it's going to be. Um, at the borough meeting on Thursday, uh, John Davies said something uh, pretty interesting, actually. We're, we're, I'm working on getting the audio clip. Um, he said, I think, I think, uh, Natalie said something about what, you know, what is this, uh, how do you address individual sovereignty with, with this issue you're discussing? And he scoffed at it and said, only governments are sovereign. 
Nice. Which I thought was pretty interesting. Do they actually take, this is just off the wall, do, do they um, locally, this small of a deal, do they actually take an oath of office? Yes. yes. To... I believe it's the same oath that um, most everybody of elected office takes, that they have to support and defend the Constitution. It's probably a yeah, state constitution. But the state constitution itself oh, yeah. says that uh, the individual, you know, the individual Alaskan is sovereign and can only give the government powers which, which they had themselves. Right. So um, anyway, just kind of funny, though, because it, it reveals uh, some truth. You know, it's not something to be upset about per se, so much as it was just a very honest thing. Well, it's, an, it's a nice opinion if <laughs> right. you're having coffee with John Davies down at Denny's. Or, right. no, we don't want to use Denny's anymore, right? <laughs> right. In case the double president's there. <laughs> right. You go have coffee with him, and he tells you that idea. That sounds great. You say, oh, fine, I disagree with you, whatever. But then he gets to go get elected and go in that building and force that opinion on you. And All they it, are doing is forcing you to do but what the, you wouldn't the do The question, though, is, Josh, for me, is what if it were reversed? What if you were the one elected? Would you be going into that building over there and forcing John Davies oh, to do the be hell to pay. that he didn't want to do? The, re the, reason why I, the reason why I throw that out here is I know there are an awful lot of people right now that are very upset about the, the, the president's order, which I... I you know, it's it's part of the Obamacare issue. So mm -hmm. it's something that was actually approved by your congressmen and senators. Thank you very much. Uh, that, that idea that somehow everybody has to provide contraceptives for, and and whatever kind of other kind of birth control, which to, to include abortion in some cases for their employees. And of course, I got a lot of the Catholics very upset because it directly violates their personal beliefs. And so now this so-called compromise was announced yesterday in which somehow, uh, well, the, it's not the actual organizations that have to pay. It'll be their insurance companies, which... But the insurance company has to. Who who pays the insurance? <laughs> I, anyway, the, the point is this. What's the difference between that and somebody on the flip side of the equation coming in and, and you know, outlawing abortion and and forcing someone who doesn't believe in monogamy to get married in order to validate their relationship or will only insist on certain people being able to get married. Only those that we approve can have our license to get married, whether it is this man and this woman. Oh, sorry, those cousins, they can't get married. Oh, sorry, those people of varying religious beliefs, they can't get married. I'm sorry, those people of different skin color, they can't get married. Those have all been in different states requirements for marriage licenses now this issue of gay marriage being introduced or whatever else has got people very upset i asked the question what business does the government have of determining who can get a license and who can't and, and why am I, do you get a license to get married that's my i think that's fun right there yeah and, Exactly. Why do you get a license from the well, state to get to live with because someone? Because enough people of the same opinion got together and made it a law that you needed to get a license to get married. Yeah, I was actually reading something. This is off subject, kind of, but I was reading something about. Uh, I think it was in the 1760s when England imposed a marriage license tax. They forced people to get a, t a marriage license tax. There was a lot of uproar at that time. Of course, they were idiots though back then. So, just thought I'd bring that up. It's. I think to me, it's interesting that um, a proposed funding of you know contraceptives or whatever, which would be you know a few billion dollars a year, expropriated from people at the point of a gun, gets America you know quote unquote in an uproar, right? But a trillion dollars a year taken from us <laughs> for the sole purpose of killing foreigners nobody bats an eye at that's because uh, you, to protect the lives of the unborn those are unborn americans yeah what's <laughs> funny about that is that you have not only the re it's look at the religious organizations out there that scream and yell for that trillion dollars to be taken to go kill other people half We're, of the half of the whole federal budget is, is for the sole purpose of killing foreigners and a few billion dollars for probably mostly for condoms and and birth control pills probably most of it wouldn't even be used on abortion creates this national uproar i i have to laugh at that 
<laughs> four five eight talk <laughs> is the number. Let's check out the phone lines. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Yes, good morning. This is Allie. Allie, what's on your mind today? Well, you know, everything you guys are talking about simply is as one one little thing that people have in their blood or it's just something that it's human nature and that is to control someone else. You know, it's just Flat, simple. We're, we're, we've always been that way since day one. Uh, when uh, the English came to this country, they were controlling the American natives. When the Spaniards came into the Southwest, they were doing the same thing. Uh, the Romans, you know, they did the same thing. Uh, how it would ever stop, I don't know. But right now, it's, you know, even, you know, we're imposing our, trying to impose our way of thinking in, you know, the Middle East, you know, uh, that gal the other day that went down there, she, you know, she said, "Don't follow our constitution. Our constitution ain't the best in the world, and it probably never will be, but it works for us." You know, she went down there and said, "Well, you know, our constitution isn't uh, what you guys should model your constitution after." There you go. You see, I mean, that's the kind of thinking that we got to have. Then people down there, what works for us doesn't work for them. You know what I'm saying? And. For some reason, it's, it's human nature to try and control everyone else. I mean, it's whether it's a politician. I mean, once they get in there, they'll that's the you know they'll lie to you in your face and say, yeah, this is what it, we'll do. We'll do this and we'll do that. Once they're in there, we, you know, we can't. We're done. I mean, it's it's just human nature to want to try and control other people. Well, it goes back just, to one of the things that Dave was saying earlier today, wasn't it? It's might makes right. You look exactly. at look at the exactly. experience of the of the English getting off the boats uh, onto American soil. The very first thing they did was what? Go and try to find who lived there and negotiate. Uh, hey, we'd like to live here with you. No, they just took. Exactly, exactly. It's 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 all about control. It's 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 a it's a human nature type thing. That how in the world would it, we would uh, remedy that? I I'm afraid we're stuck to it to the very end. I mean, there I don't. There's no way you're going to get, anytime you get two people talking, they both got different opinions. The one that has the upper hand will try and control the other one. <clears throat> it's almost like an animal instinct that we have in us. It's, I don't see how anybody in the face of this earth will ever be able to, you know, put an end to it. I don't see it happening. I mean, it'd be nice, you know, it, it's it's best that we all try and get along. But anytime you got two guys, you know, two two persons together, it just... I don't know how in the well, ever. Yeah, I, I would uh, not disagree with you. It's it's interesting, though, because I remember growing up, you know, as a kid, and uh, kids will say stuff like, oh, Mike makes right. Oh, I can beat you up because I'm bigger than you. And then the parents step in and go, no, no, that's not actually how it is. Exactly. <laughs> and then I grow up and I find out the parents are just as guilty of it as we were. When Actually, we were kids. it is how it is. Sorry, kids. <laughs> right. Exactly. There, exactly. Are, there are a few historical uh, examples, though, right here. Well, on the mainland United States, um, where it did happen for several years at a time. There were different colonists that uh, separated from Massachusetts and um, different colonists that separated from the Carolinas, different colonists separated from Virginia and started their own colonies based on the fact where basically they had no government at all and they lived without forcing their will on other people the only stipulation was you left people alone and it exactly. has happened several times in american history pre-american i guess pre-united uh, uh -huh. states so i think there is it can happen i understand exactly what you're saying unfortunately but look we have 300 and some odd or 500 whatever people that rule three mil 300 million exactly Exactly, so, but but even then, people back in the 17th century, when they and I think a lot of them were the Amish, you know, they would uh, move out, do their own little thing. The problem was that the other group wouldn't leave them alone. So then the other group goes over to control them. So someone was trying to get something going on the right, you know, let okay, this is what we want, you know, let's leave everybody alone, um, you know, whatever floats your boat's fine. But the minute they establish themselves, then here comes. The other group, oh no, this is the way it's got to be done. Yeah, that's a good point. That did happen. Yes, so, it was the, uh... so no matter how hard someone tries to say, okay, well, let's do this right, and this is the way it ought to be, then here comes old 
Johnny come lately, you know, that's, that's no, that's not the way it's done, you see. And it's, it's a matter of people, I think, trying to control their own opinions, you know, respect other people's beliefs. Do, um, would you say that, that we should just give up then? No, no, absolutely not. What we got to do is recognize that, like this uh, deal with all this birth control going on, uh, I don't know why they feel that we, that I should pay for someone else. Why should the Catholic Church, that's against the Catholic Church's beliefs. According to the good book, we all will pay for our own sins. Let's worry about our own souls, you know. I mean, let's don't start throwing, you know, and, and like I said, you see, I mean, it's, it's all control. Only I will pay for my own sins, according no, to the good Lord. That's a really good point. And ultimately, only you can control your own actions. Exactly. Right. But let's leave it up to Mr. Obama. He'll take mm. care of everybody for us. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Ali, I've got, I've got one last quick question for you here. On, in your own personal life, do you do you find yourself uh, going and trying to force your neighbors to do what you want Absolutely them to do? Absolutely not. Absolutely Perfect. not. Perfect. I get, I get along with my neighbors. I grow a garden. I share. I go down to Valdez. I share my fish with them. I don't sell it to them. I give it to them. I give it to them, and I come back. That way they got fresh fish. So what, what um, about somebody who in your name? I'm sorry? What about somebody who in your name is forcing your neighbors to do something for you? And when, I, when I'm saying specifically, I'm, I'm making an allusion to the borough. Mm-hmm. The borough is taking your tax dollars to force your neighbors to do things for the sake of the community. The sake of the community, it's, it's, it's the sake of each individual person. Everybody does. I mean, I don't burn wood. I got a wood stove. Why I got a wood stove? That, that came in the house. It doesn't bother me. Uh, if my neighbor doesn't mow his, I, I love to mow my lawn. My neighbor, you know, he's, you know, they can do whatever they want with their own yard. I don't care. It doesn't bother me. You know, it's it's like that old saying where uh, two buddies are together and drinking a beer, and then the wife gets mad at his buddy or whatever, and he looks at his other buddy, and uh, the guy tells him, "Hey, don't look at me. I got to live with her." And it's, it's <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, totally. And, and and that's the way it is. Everybody just, you know, if if we would all try to, you know, let's stick to our own little things, you know. I mean, I mean, life's rough enough. I mean, anybody can be miserable. Let's, let, you know, it's best to get along, I would think. But yeah. I don't know. And that I starts. Know. You're totally right. That starts with and each of us as individuals. And it's got to start at the house. You know, you start with your own kid. Uh, the best, the best uh, people in the face of the earth are these little kids that are between two and five years old whose souls are innocent. But you, you can get seven different uh, kids of, of all different natures, and they will all get along. Yeah, some t- something for us to learn from that, maybe. <laughs> exactly. Right. Exactly. Well, thank you, guys. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks for, the for the call, call. Ali. You betcha. 458 Talk is the number. The lines are loaded. We'll come right back to them after the break. Here we got the Fox News coming up here on Patriots Lament. Real quick, Dave, what's our contact information? Uh, the email is patriotslament at gmail.com, and the blog is patriotslament.blogspot.com. Get up, pack it in, let me begin. I can no win, battle me, that's a sin. I won't ever slack up, punk, you better back up. Try and play the role and you're the whole crew will act up. Get up, stand up, come on, come on throw your hands up. If you got the feeling, jump up, touch the ceiling. Monks, let's up, punk, love, someone's fucking jump. All right, up, welcome back to Patriot's Lament right here on KFAR. I'm Steve Floyd, the monkey behind the machine on the other side of the panel. We've got Dave Giesel from the Fairbanks Campaign for Liberty, and we've got Josh Bennett from Bighorn Enterprises. <laughs> Wasn't that great news break, guys? I mean, like every single story today had to do with entertainment. No no mention at all about the forces that are building up in the Persian Gulf. No, no mention of India no longer using U.S. dollar to buy oil, only gold. No, no mention of the Greece being in a, a state of panic and more riots and the fact that we're looking at a complete total economic collapse of the entire world system coming any day now. Oh, no, let's talk about Adele and how she's going to be singing for the first time after her vocal cord surgery. Wow. Isn't that exciting? That's great. It's so nice. She's got such a beautiful voice. Heart hitting. <laughs> well, you know, to, to be fair, um, if you really wanted to talk about stuff that people have uh, any sort of influence over, those news breaks would be local news. You know, to be fair, uh, we would have to have money to pay somebody to be here to get vocal news. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, Dave right. and I were just talking about the last call. That was really 
It was a good call. Appreciate him calling in. And I think one of the things that hold people back to just go along with the system as it is, to, to just go along with the flow, the status quo, is people think in their minds, they go, well, nothing will change. Because there will always be someone evil out there that wants to rule over us. And I think it was, uh, I don't know, it was in the market for liberty. They talk about that in there also. They said, yes, you'll never have utopia where everyone's just nice to each other and they get along. But you'll always have that guy that's the jerk or wants to rule over you, blah, blah, blah. The point is to stop ourselves from institutionalizing the force that we have now. Don't give it sanction anymore. We know there's going to be bad people all the time. But it doesn't mean we don't keep striving to live what we keep talking about here every week, where we just exchange freely, live freely, that we'll always have the jerks and the guys that want to force their will upon you. But if they're not sanctioned by the public per se, that's what we want to get away from, well, okay. the sanctioned use of force. Would you say us. then at this point, made by your own reasoning, then technically virtually every single election that we've had since the 1980s has not been sanctioned because we've had, what, a one in four people turning out to vote? It's sanctioned so, in the fact that they're still there. Yeah, that's another one of the fun uh, myths of democracy is, is even if you believe in majority rule, it's like, well, the majority voted for that guy. And in, like, borough elections, you know, 30% of people vote, 20% of people vote, and maybe you only get like 40% of that if you have a three-way race. So and, the and, idea that the and, idea that um, the the public sanctions uh, the rulers itself is on shaky ground. Oh, and, and you hear people bemoan, oh, it's such a low turn voter turnout. Isn't that a shame? And it's <laughs> it's actually terrific. It shows that, uh, that people either don't care or that they don't support uh, the system. I mean, it's a step towards, you, you could look at it if you were an optimist, as they step towards what Josh is talking about, where people don't sanction uh, that system and they don't want to provide, you know, a vending machine of coercion for politicians to type in, you know, their flavor of the week. <laughs> hey, hey, Josh, here's 50 cents. Could you go grab me a little bit of police uh, brutality for me right down there? There's the vending machine. Got the tax increase and some enforcement powers. Right on. B6 and A5. <laughs> Point five eight dog is the number. Good morning, caller. Welcome to Patriots Lament. Who's this? Am I on? I might be. Depends on who you are. This is Will Finley. Will, you are on. Congratulations. What's on your mind? Oh, wonderful. I was just wondering if I could put another shameless plug out there for Ron Paul. Yeah, go for it. All right. We're meeting at Denny's at noon today. We're going to be talking the same thing again about the political process and uh, uh, encourage people to come on out and visit with us at noon at Denny's today. Sweet. Yeah, I wanted to also bring up another a question for you. Go I'm, for it. I'm looking at the uh, Declaration of Independence, and we all know these words that uh, among the uh, thing unalienable rights is life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Of course, that's pursuit of property. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, derived their just powers from the consent of the governed. Uh, that whatever, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these and it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it. So going back up here, it's their governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. They're to secure these rights for the people. So um, I understand what you're, you're pursuing with uh, the distribution of power to the people themselves, and you mentioned uh, foreign powers or other powers that want to enforce their will upon you. How do we reconcile that to have a... Uh, a, a government that will actually protect the individual's own power, their own rights. You won't. If you look at uh, the Declaration of Independence is a great, uh, fantastic document. Up to that point, you would never have seen anything of the sort. I mean, you did have Magna Carta and stuff like that, but it didn't actually go down to the low-level man. But you will never have a government, even our own. Those guys fought the revolution. They freed themselves from the bonds of the monarch and turned right around and put in a whole brand new bondage exactly. on the people. It's a great theory, but it does not work. The theory that you can have a small government that is only there to protect your private property, which sounds great 
and that's what they intended. I believe Jefferson definitely believes that. But once they get that power, they have to keep themselves going. They have to grow. The government has to grow. It has to self-sustain. It has to sustain itself. And the only way it can sustain itself is to take from you to grow. So it cannot work. There is no such thing as a limited government to protect your rights. Your rights are only protected by yourself. You, your unalienable rights can be given up by yourself. You can give up your rights, and when you have this government, that's exactly what they've done. They've taken those because we've ceded them to them. So are you concluding then that given the, the I guess, the world situation, knowing that we have those people who'd want to enforce their wills upon us, uh, is there a remedy? <laughs> that's, a, that's a really great question. And let, let, me, let me just uh, point out from history, and I'm going to let you make your own decision, okay? Uh, pointing out from history, every single time you've had a government that has expanded to the point of empire, it cannot sustain itself. The only way it is sustained is by force, by taking over more territory, by taxing the people, by military conquest. You see it in, in, in Greece, you see it in Persia, you see it in the history of Rome. Every single time it has either been a military defeat or an internal collapse that has led to the destruction of that empire. At the point of the destruction of the empire, when it has fallen, there have been little pockets of freedom that have sprung up. And for a brief period of time, on a limited scale, it always has to be a small scale, because once you start getting into trying to enforce your will on the people, I mean, they even just look here in Fairbanks, if the people of Fairbanks tried to enforce our will on the people in Fox, they're just over the hills from us. It starts to fall apart. It has to be a limited government. It has to be a limited way for it to work, right? Otherwise, it stops being free people, and it starts being ruled people. Sure. Yeah. Um, to, I don't know. My, my take on that question is that in the long term, um, you know, our, our goal is we're, we're pursuing something that's 100 years out, maybe, maybe more, right? Um, we're taking the first step in a thousand mile journey here with with a new philosophy and so um if we look you know what's the hope for the next 10 years or 20 years or 30 years probably not much um but we have to remember you know other movements the abolitionist movement took hundreds of years uh to go from a few you know loonies in the wilderness saying that uh, people shouldn't own other people to um, the actual abolition of slavery, which didn't really start happening till the, you know, early 19th century. So we're laying the groundwork for something that uh, is going to take a long time, you know, maybe generations, because people are going to have to come to the conclusion that, you know, most the average guy in the street is going to have to come to the conclusion that the best way for him to live is not might makes right. And we're a long ways from that right now. But by living that ourselves, like that first caller said, we are taking the first step on that journey. And by inculcating it among our children. And were That's you, right. were you kind That's of right. asking, what do we do about a foreign, a foreign intervention? Well, I guess there's a two-part question, both foreign and uh, domestic, uh, you know, where we've got, like you say, whether it be the Washington or even our borough assembly declaring themselves only the sovereign and having the uh, foreknowledge to how to, to uh, know how to run your own lives, uh, you know, how do we address that? And it sounds like we're doing the best we can now. We just have to stay the course. Yeah, it took thousands of years, literally, for the Declaration of Independence to come about. Yeah. So we're doing pretty good. I mean, if you look at the process up to that point and where we are in the last 200 years, I think we're doing pretty well. Not as far as our government's not doing really well, but the thinking on... The philosophy, whatever, of liberty has come so far in the last 200 years, it's amazing of where we've come but from. In, yeah. the, in the chat room right now, there's been a little discussion on how what we're talking about today is just a bunch of utopian ideals, and they're being dismissed because of that uh, that notion that's of, okay. of we're, utopian. We're, how do you answer that criticism? That's okay. We're just we're taking the first step here. You know, the, the All of the arguments against um, a free society, a society without government, are exactly the same as the arguments against the abolition of slavery. Mm -hmm. All of them are the same. Um, if we abolish slavery, 
there will be chaos in the streets because these people don't know how to live their own lives. The same if, thing. If we abolish key. slavery, who will who will pick the cotton? You know, if we abolish the state, who will pave the roads? They're all the same arguments fundamentally, and that's okay. It just shows that we're we're early on. We're laying the groundwork, and a long time from now, when when people can understand that. Pointing guns at other people is not the most efficient way or the most effective way or the most moral way to organize society. Um, it, the state will go away. And if you, were a, if you were around during the 1770s or 1780s, whatever, you would have thought the same thing if you're a European. Dave's brought this up several times before. They looked at the colonies wanting to get away from a king. They never heard of such a thing. Mm, yeah, they, How would they and, live? In uh, continental Europe, about? yeah, in continental Europe, they referred to the uh, the Republicans because of the republic form of government in the uh, U.S. They said, "Oh, those crazy Republicans," and they meant it in the same way that people today say, "You know, those those anarchists or those libertarians." <laughs> it's like those crazy Republicans over in America. You would never want to go there. It's complete chaos. And then what do you have? You know, twenty, thirty, forty years later, massive amounts of immigrants coming over. Uh, the Industrial Revolution happening here to mm -hmm. a much greater extent than it happened anywhere else in the world. Um, all of these things. So, I mean, it takes time, and the fact that people are, the fact the fact that people are taking the time to acknowledge the idea and dismiss it shows that the idea at least has some power. If it was, if they really believed it was an absolutely crazy Looney Tunes idea, they wouldn't say anything about it. So in, in the chat room again here, Sutsi says, "Well, that's believing the war will go away completely. It won't." No, I just said that a few minutes ago. It, you're always going to have some jerk that wants to rule you. We quit sanctioning that. Quit institutionalizing. What we've done is we've institutionalized a government that goes to war all over the world. We have institutionalized that. We have made that become what it is. Yeah. So what we're saying is we take away the institutionalized use of mm -hmm. force. You're still going to have your individuals out there, but take away the power that they have. Yeah, you can't have, if you don't have uh, nation states, if we skip a step, right, and imagine a world without nation states, um, what country would go to war with what country? If we identified with the city we lived in or the town or, or our family or something like that, or, or the company we worked for or whatever, how would you have groups of hundreds of millions or tens of millions of people um, blindly marching across a border to kill tens of millions of people who they've never met? It's just it's unfathomable if you don't have these um, imaginary lines and these imaginary groups for us to call ourselves uh, so we can hate someone else who we've never met. Thanks for the call. Appreciate it. 458 Talk is a number. Good morning, caller. Welcome to Patriots Lament. Who's this? Hello. Hey, who is this? Joe. Joe, go ahead. Hi. <clears throat> um, I, I just want to address an earlier discussion you had about this. Uh, <clears throat> you have a... Uh, uh, the problem with uh, democracy, you're, you're going to vote against somebody else's desires and beat them because you have more people than they do. Well, the whole point of the thing is it's just an expedient. You basically have a voting system because, you, first of all, you agree to that. You agree that that's how voting works. If you don't agree to that, then, of course, you're going to have uh, dissatisfied customers. But once you all agree to that, uh, and, and as Lincoln established clearly, once you agree to it, you are in it. And that's that's the, the way it is. But there's one question I have. This is the important question. I never voted for the Constitution of the United States. I don't even know if I would. I'm not convinced that it says the things that I believe are right and true and just. So uh, having uh, had democracy imposed upon me and being stuck with it because it's in my environment, uh, I don't, I'm not exactly sure how I should react to it. Uh, you, no, no. That's an interesting point. Have you ever read um, Lysander Spooner's essay, uh, No Treason, The Constitution of No Authority? No. I would really, really highly recommend that you check that out because he calls the same thing into question. He says, uh, you know, we're told that the Constitution is this binding social contract between us and the government. But he says, I never signed it. I never agreed to it. And no person alive today did. He said if, if the Constitution was binding on anyone, it was only binding on the people who wrote it and signed it. You know, which, and he, he wrote this in, he wrote this in the, you know, 1860, 1870. Which goes back to your original point, you know, Joe, that, that basically once we all agree to it in terms of the voting aspect, then it's going to be binding on us. But none of us have ever agreed to it. 
Exactly. So, so the very process by which we are going out and voting and and inflicting our will on others or having others' wills inflicted on us is completely without our consent. But there, but there is another question. Uh, you notice that all the all the muzzies over there, uh, like the Ayatollah, they, they admire that religious uh, government, and uh, and that the socialists all admire their socialist governments in Europe and Northern Europe, and we admire our capitalistic free for all so called system over here. Uh, when you look at those different systems and realize that they have millions of people who have grown up in those systems, and they all defend the systems, it comes to the point where you you start to wonder if. It isn't just like a, an, an ecological thing. You inherit the system, and you just make it work the best you can. In other words, no matter what you get, if you're a, if you have a king, or no matter what it is, if you have good people, they can make it work. Um, yeah, that's right. I mean, that's probably uh, if you have people. Well, if you you say good people, if you have good people, if you have people who don't commit violence against each other. Um, then yeah, their society is going to be more more it peaceful. Really, sort of it doesn't really matter what your government system is. Yeah. If, if the individuals or the people in government or the people that live next door to you, there, there is another interesting angle on that point, uh, which is that you know whatever you grow up in, you will tend to uh, defend. There, yeah, there's a massive confirmation bias on that, right? Whatever system you grow up in, or ruler you grow up under, or whatever, you you tend to defend tooth and nail. And um, I actually I had this discussion with somebody. We were talking about. This other friend of mine, we were talking about how older people have a bigger difficulty in questioning the political systems around them than younger people. But they don't necessarily have a difficult time questioning scientific ideas or math or things like this. In school, and this is true in any country, whatever system you grow up under, um, you learn, you know, uh, these are the scientific laws and physics and chemistry and literature and all this stuff. And you also learn that these are changing and developing Right. And math is changing and, you know, technology is changing. And and these changes are something you're going to have to live with. That same idea that that new ideas could emerge and that you need to be open to those is completely excluded Mm -hmm. in the teaching of social studies in school. You're never taught that, you know, this is the political system we have and nobody really knows if it's optimal or not. And, you know, keep an open mind about it. You're never taught that in that in that particular realm. And it doesn't matter what country you grow up in. You, You learn that. What you have is the best. That's why you have it. Um, but only in that one specific field, thanks, which, which is interesting. Thanks very much for the call, Joe. 458 Talk is a number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Hello. Hey, who is this? It's Cecily. Good morning, Cecily. Welcome to Patriots Lament. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was just watching a, a show and it, um, called Maverick, and it was, and I, it was so cute. I heard one man's political rise is another man's prison se- sentence. It's kind of kind of uh, apt. It's supposed to be funny, but uh, yeah, no, it's, it's unfortunately very... true. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, the other thing is, is if we taught more about relating to each other rather than competition, we might find a a, a better way. Just how does how do we relate to each other is is pretty important to to understand rather than competing. And uh, when competition is put there. That, then, uh, you know, one person wins and the other person loses. But when you teach how it relates, then there can be a co-creative project. Yeah, you know, that's an interesting point. And so in in politics as a way of socially interacting, um, there's a winner and a loser, right? There's a winner and a loser in elections. There's a winner and loser in taxation. Somebody gets because someone else loses. And in a, a market exchange, um, I know that word is has been tainted by the fascists in this country. But in a market exchange, by definition, both parties participating, win. have to they have to expect, they have to at least expect that they'll be better off after they trade. I, I would not be giving you money or, or trading right, my services buy, for something that I didn't want from you. Yeah. When, and, you, when you go to the store and buy something, the reason that you're get, paying a certain price is because you expect that you'll be more satisfied with the product you're buying than with the money you gave for that. uh, But if you go and you get a contract with the government and the government says you are the only one that I can buy X, Y, or Z from, and then you extort taxes from me to pay for your product or service, you know, look at the government services that are paid for by tax dollars, whether it is a, a, an employee or whether it is a, okay, I'm going to say it, whether it's a public school teacher 
or whether it's a university professor or whether it's somebody working on air quality, those are services that I personally or you or you or you may not choose to go and buy. And yet we are forced to buy those services through our taxes. Right. It, it, rem- and, the, yeah. it removes the whole bidding, the bidding process. And you can't know. I mean, obviously, there would still be teachers and things like this, but you can't know how many there would be, what what they would get paid, all of these things um, with the current system we have in place, which is very which is basically fascistic, where you have these um, private groups that receive public money uh, that's taken by force. Thanks for the call, Cecily. Four, could, five, eight. Uh, yeah. Th- did you have something? Okay, I had I had one other thing I wanted to uh, talk about. Um, when Will called in, he was saying, "So you know, what do we do? Uh, what do you guys just take?" There's another angle to this, which is um, all of the effective movements for social change, be they good or bad, have been very long term oriented. So, like the Fabian socialists who set up in in England. Their minimum time frame for accomplishing a social change was like 50 years, and most of their goals were 100 years out. And so the people who started this movement, uh, which I personally did not think was a good one, had these goals that existed beyond their lifetime. They said, I'm probably not going to see this come to fruition, but we're going to take a very, very long uh, time scale, and we're just going to pick away at it just a little bit at a time. And we're not going to get caught up in this high time preference, you know, two, four, six year cycle where we have to accomplish X, Y and Z by by this date. They said we're going to push. We're going to have a huge, huge time scale and we're just going to go slow and and take our time at this. And that's part of the reason they were so effective is with a huge time scale. You can actually pay attention to things like education Mm -hmm. or indoctrination, you know, in this case, perhaps. And uh, and these deeper social movements. And as long as as long as we, uh, you know, the people advocating for liberty instead of uh, more tyranny, are wrapped up in high time preference, short time frame goals, we do that at the expense of longer time frame, far more important, far more impactful goals. And and you look at some, uh, you look at how we get whipped into a frenzy. I say we, I mean collectively, all of us as Americans, sure. but by the political the cycle, average, yeah, the average. And, and you look at even in just this last week, the issue with the the abortion and the. Uh, birth control and all of that other stuff that's been whipping into a frenzy this last week. Yeah, it, I think it is obscuring the long-term effect of what's going on right now with our American experiment. Oh, sure. I mean, yeah, you could easily make that argument. The long-term trend doesn't budge um, as long as you're trying to put out, you know, little fires. Like, you know, oh my God, the issue of the week week is X. I'm going to focus all my effort on that and. The only way that there's any effective social change ever, for better or for worse, is when people take a very long uh, time scale on the thing and focus on, on long-term goals. There, there are two, two sayings that we had in the Army that helped me to prioritize when somebody came to me with something that they wanted me to get done, and I've used them here at the radio station all the time. One is the tyranny of the urgent. That idea that somehow the, the, the fact that you need this done right now trumps everything else that has to be done, get, get done. Do not yield to the tyranny of the urgent. That's the first thing. No matter how important somebody else thinks something is, no matter how important you think something is, just because it's urgent does not mean that it's the most important thing that you need to get done. The second issue, or, or the second saying, is your lack of planning does not constitute an emergency on my part. <laughs> right. Just because you forgot to do something and you want me to fix it doesn't mean that I need to drop everything to go and take care of your issue. And I, I think, you know, going back to what Will was saying and what you were just saying, Dave, if, if we all were to take a look at our own private lives and prioritize a little bit and saying, okay, how much time am I spending just trying to pay this week's, this month's bills? Time preference. Exactly. Yeah, even the, the very first caller, you know, talking about um, spending time with your kids. You know, how many if if the average person who gets wrapped up in a political election, you know, maybe they spend 100 hours on it. What if they spend 100 hours every two years with their kids, 100 hours extra? You know, yeah, you wouldn't see it. You wouldn't see, you know, whoever your guy of the week is get elected. But do you see that anyway? And wouldn't that be more? Mm-hmm. Isn't that a more meaningful purpose? I mean, your kid is going to be around for a long time. Your mm-hmm. your kid, your kid's actually going to listen to ideas and 
you know, and have a, a chance at actually making a difference in the world. What, Whereas you're elected, the guy who you go and meet at a politician meet and greet mm-hmm. is just going to lie to you and get your vote and see you. But and that, and that same that same preference, if you show that toward you know working that extra couple of hours, why? So you can go and get another snow machine. You know, when, when it comes time to pass on your belongings to your kids, are they going to want your 50 year old snow machine? <laughs> Or are they going to look back and cherish the memories they had of the time that they spent together with you without a snow machine? No. Yeah, there's yeah, there's long-term questions like that, and, oh. and they get they get swept under the uh, political rug. Yeah, and the enemies of liberty are very patient. And, and speaking of being very patient, we had uh, the callers that have been on hold for uh, 15, 20 minutes that never got through today. So once again, our contact number, Dave? Uh, the, the email is uh, patriotslament. Uh, at gmail.com and the blog is patriotslament.blogspot.com so uh, the best way to get in touch is just post a comment on the blog on one of our posts perfect and and one of the action points I'm going to extrapolate from something you said earlier is to look up Lysander Spooner the Constitution of No Authority yep and uh, give that a read this week Lysander Spooner in fact anything by Lysander Spooner will get your juices flowing (laughs) thanks for being here on patriots lament coming up next it's health talk and i will be back again on monday morning for the better breakfast show have a great weekend try not to do anything that'll get you in the police blotter unless of course it is for the sake of liberty